Hey, Tom. Hi, Gautam. I hear you. Awesome. Thanks. I just on the mute, and, uh, I see a lot of you at the. Add some instructions to follow. Uh, let me just do them really quick. Thierry just announced our session at the operators one and it just finished up. So it may take a minute or two for people to shift over. Great, yes. And I might take that minute to set up this recording, I guess. We're also the same time as the client gap meeting yeah. and Mari and Victoria are covering Manila and it. Awesome. So Tom, did you did you do the uh, host ID thing, and uh, and this live custom live streaming service thing? Um, to get in today, I uh, hmm. is that what you mean? No, I got an email from uh, Jimmy. Uh, oh, let me see. Jimmy MacArthur, and he asked me to use the host ID to join, and oh no, I did not. I just clicked on the link. I can see. Did you join that way? I actually don't get that thing, but let me uh, let me let me uh, drop and join back in. Okay, ahead. I will hold out here. Awesome, thank you. So for anyone on the call, we're we're making the uh, we're still setting up a little bit, and people are. Uh, I know some people were in the previous sessions and are on their way over. We had an adventure yesterday morning with our forum session. Um, this seems to be going quite well uh, in terms of setup. We're, Gotham's just figuring out how to join with the host ID. So hopefully we can record from there. Hi, Tom. Can you hear me? Good morning. Yeah. Hi, Vita. Hi. I uh, was trying, I could see you guys, but couldn't join with uh, Firefox. So I switched. Uh, I guess I'm okay. Sure. For those of you who do not have it, um, I'm putting the um, Etherpad link in the chat. Um, so while we set up, if you get a chance, uh, please add your um, ID or name um, under the attendees section in the Etherpad. Thanks, Carlos. I see you doing it. And that way we can know who's here and follow up with people later if we appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You can see there a list of topics and read ahead in them and see if any of them connect with uh, your concerns. And you should, of course, feel free. It's an Etherpad, this collaborative, and this is a forum. So 
um, please uh, do go on and add things that are on your mind as operational concerns um, for Manila adoption. Um, and this is, of course, also a fine forum for uh, asking questions about Manila itself and whether the service would be appropriate for you to use. Hi, Mike. Thank you for making a comment here. Um, I, maybe I can speak. I don't know. Is my mic muted? Yeah. No, I can hear you. Um, oh. What, uh, you just remarked that you're going to launch Manila in your cloud and that you have a Cepheus cluster. Um, I meant it just auto-corrected me. Go ahead, Mike. So yeah, we're we're about to launch a CephFS cluster. Um, it it auto corrected me for Cepheus. I don't know what that is. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we're about to launch a Manila share. So we've been running um, a cloud for oh, a while, and um, we have an RBD cluster already running. And so we built our own CephFS cluster to run Object Store and CephFS off of the. Um, so that we don't have to worry about our RBD cluster getting trounced by some best traffic. Um, and so we've rolled out Manila on top of it. I'm wondering if there's any security concerns that we should be worried about. One person um, in our team was worried that because we have to open up um, access to the client network, um, that all the clients would then be able to see the mons directly. That there's no proxying um, between, um, um, between, sorry, OpenStack and the clients. Is, is there anything to worry about there? Um, yeah, let, let's come back to the question in just a second. Uh, Gotham, I see you are, are yeah. back in. Uh, yeah, no, I uh, didn't want to just saying that. Uh, sorry about that. The I was yeah, just we, checking whether this uh, is streaming live on the Summit app, uh, and it is. Uh, so I guess someone else did this for me. Uh, I, uh, excellent. I, I see Erin as, as a host. Uh, so thanks, Erin. Because I was trying to figure out if I should I should set this up for streaming. Anyway, so it's already so, streaming. So, not, so we're going to come back to Mike in just a second. Yes. And thank you. Um, we were just talking informally before while we waited for you to start up the session, Gotham. Yep. Um, I will just say I'm my name's Tom Barron, and I I, I used to be the uh, uh, PTL of Manila a couple cycles ago. Um, Gotham, who I'm talking to is now, and he can introduce himself, but the project is in, in much better hands now, but I still help out a little bit every now and then. And then we'll come back and, and talk about Mike's operational concern from Mike Cave in just a minute. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so thank you so much for joining everyone uh, and uh, hope you're having a great day so far at the summit. Uh, I'm Gautam Pacha Ravi uh, and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat and also the uh, current project team lead for uh, the OpenStack Manila team. Uh, and many of my uh, team uh, teammates are here, contributors, uh, long time contributors to OpenStack Manila and uh, well, this is one. This is the first time I'm doing a session. Tom's done a bunch of these, uh, so uh, we, we're going to be talking in tandem, I guess. Uh, and we we'll, we we have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, and this the, all, all of I mean, the session is basically for you and us to in, uh, to interact, network, ask us questions, and uh, and then maybe we can we can have some. <clears throat> 
um, you know, um, feedback to take back to the next week uh, where we uh, contributors are meeting uh, for a project team gathering. Uh, all virtually, and you're welcome to join us over there as well. I'll leave some details on the Etherpad. Uh, and if it's not already, the Etherpad link is now on the chat as well as on the uh, Discuss comment thread. Um, and if you're if you're watching this on the Discuss comment thread, please uh, feel free to join us on the Zoom call so you can uh, you can actually talk to us live or, or chat with us uh, using the Zoom uh, chat thread. We will take all of these uh, back to the etherpad as well, but it's always nice to have that two-way communication. So thank you, Gautam. Um, um, Mike Cave um, yes. just introduced himself and um, brought up a concern. Um, uh, Mike, uh, I, would you repeat yourself? I I would really appreciate it. Yeah, sure, no problem. So. Um, my question was around, I guess, the security concerns that were raised by one of our teammates um, around when you enable Manila um, and the inside of OpenStack that allows the um, users access to the Ceph client network because they now need to be able to talk to the mons directly and as well as all the OSDs. So, um, I guess the question is, is there any security concerns around having that level of access? Um, and is there maybe any way to set up proxy networks in, inside of Manila so that the clients don't actually see the monitors directly? I don't know, this is a question from one of my teammates. I don't think there's a way to do any of this, but um, is there security concerns? Because now the clients can sniff the traffic on the client network. So anybody who has access to that Manila network now has access to the client network and data traveling over it. So that's the big concern and then access to the monitors. So I'll say a couple words about this. There, there are a number of aspects to this um, question. Um, first of all, um, CephFS itself um, is an interesting file system protocol and that it relies on um, a smart client to do things like enforce various delegations and to um, enforce quotas, Ceph quotas, not Manila quotas, but when you make a uh, Manila share of a certain size and it's implemented with CephFS, it's a Ceph quota on the back end that's uh, enforcing the size. Um, so, um, at, at Red Hat, to give an example, um, we have um, lots of customers who, um, first of all, we have some customers that run public clouds. And then secondly, we have customers that run enterprise private clouds um, where the tenants, regular users with member privileges and a Keystone project, but who are not administrators, um, are not really trusted. They're not trusted to muck around with the infrastructure. So we document how to um, only expose the Ceph public network in our deployments um, to trusted tenants. And then for regular tenants who are untrusted, and they're untrusted, of course, in the sense that I'm not trusted to manage your bank account or you mine. Uh, it's not a per character assessment. Um, we can uh, talk about that later. Yes, uh, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, sure. Uh, if you want to leave your account uh, in my chat room um, over here, um, that's <laughs> fine. Um, um, untrusted tenants are not allowed on that network directly, and we we deploy an NFS gateway um, for general regular users um, for that reason. Um, so CephFS clients um, need to be run by trusted tenants. Um, by trusted tenants, you need to make sure you know you you, you have out of band communication with them beyond the APIs. You know what they're deploying. You know that their CVEs are up to date, uh, CVE fixes are up to date. That type of thing. Um, okay. Just to give you an example, it depends on your cloud. 
um, CERN, uh, whom you may have heard of, <laughs> uh, featured here uh, in, in large at the, at the summit, um, has a large set of trusted tenants because their researchers who are using their cloud are, um, first of all, they have a good way to keep, keep, keep the software up to date um, and so on. And then, you know, they're working on fundamental problems of the universe rather than trying to hack in um, to the infrastructure. Um, yeah, and they also run flat networks over there, so they don't run through Neutron either. So they have a bit of a different networking setup where they can expose their networks um, differently to their clients as opposed to us, where we run it through the network, uh, through the Neutron agents. Yeah, and can you tell, uh, do you mind telling us a little bit about your application and your um, your, your OpenStack deployment? Um, are you a commercial? Are you research? What, what are you doing? Yeah, so we're a research cloud. Um, we run um, the largest cloud site for Compute Canada, um, obviously in Canada. So it's um, it's the cloud only site. Yeah, so we've got multiple HPC sites and we're the cloud only site or the, the biggest cloud only site. Um, and uh, it's a 40,000 core cloud. Our RBD clusters, six petabytes. Our CephFS clusters, 13 petabytes. Our, we have about 650 tenants. Um, we have, we do some HPC, but mostly portal work. Um, our clients can come in and ask for a, an allocation on the cloud. Um, they do require a federated ID. And so they are quote unquote trusted in that sense when they get their, their project set up, but they then can go ahead and, and allow access obviously once they get VMs going to anybody that may or may not be part of the consortium, so. Right, so you may have, uh, your colleague may have a point. I mean, I, I don't have an opinion on this, so you make up your own, own mind. Uh, but, um, um, you know, it, essentially, if you have a Ceph client, you're able to access storage infrastructure. Um, you may not have the keys and so on to do it, but you could um, theoretically mount DOS attacks on the network. Um, and with respect to your own, you could substitute in a different client or have an out of date client that has a CVE, et cetera. So those are the type of concerns that uh, come with, with native CFFS. Okay. Um, so we, uh, as I said, use an NFS gateway from Ganesha um, uh, today. We're also working on, and we have, we'll have a session at the PTG uh, with Nova next week on um, Vert IO FS approach, where um, basically remote file systems like CephFS can be exposed to a compute node. So the CephFS client will be running uh, under administrative control on a compute node. Um, and then the remote file system is exposed over Vert IO FS through a hypervisor, more or less like you do with RBD um, today. Oh. Okay. Um, two VMs. So this is a uh, work in progress, um, early stages. Vert IOFS has just made its way um, into um, production Linux kernels, um, although it's been in the works for several years. Um, and that will also be an approach to addressing this. Um, we think it has promise of being a more scalable approach than the NFS gateway um, stuff because the NFS gateways um, run um, today, um, run um, really you can only run an active passive type setup or active standby type setup. Um, and we don't have a way to scale that out. But, so we run it in a pacemaker cluster and that limits the scaling ability. Sure, yeah, I mean, currently our use cases, um, number of clients will be small, their requirements on size will be large. So we buy, I guess one of my, one follow-up question would be if we turned on CephFS, it's open to the clients in the share menu and on the APIs. 
do they automatically now just have access to the client network? I mean, not unless they have, uh, I mean, so I, you'd assume that the Ceph cluster is exposed via some sort of a provider network into, into the OpenStack, right? right? And so unless the clients have access to create ports on that provider network, they do not have access directly to the client, uh, to the CephFS shares. Uh, so if they want to mount the shares onto their VMs, they will need to plug into that storage uh, network that you're, uh, the Ceph public network that you're exposing. Okay, so and, we can and, we can lock it off that way as well. Yeah. Yes. And uh, in fact, uh, in the um, downstream Red Hat sixteen dot one documentation, you will find guidance that Gautam Pasha Ravi wrote <laughs> uh, about um, how to selectively expose that network to certain tenants rather than others. There's nothing specific to Red Hat about that. Uh, that's a technique anybody could use. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Um, we are going ahead with this regardless of the concerns. We feel fairly confident in our user base that we can get this done. Um, but it's interesting just to kind of play out the scenario almost a little bit here. Also, it's 6.30 in the morning where I'm at, so I'm a little out of it. So thanks very much for answering my question. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, so you're in Vancouver area? I'm on uh, Vancouver Island, yeah. Oh, nice. Beautiful place. Got Gotham is in a slightly less advanced country, <laughs> uh, a little bit uh, to the south of you, but in the same time zone. Oh, have I heard of it? Yes. Yeah. So I live in Seattle. <laughs> nice. Nice. Awesome. Uh, so any further concerns on CephFS? Uh, Mike, I did throw in some links on the uh, to the uh, documentation that we have regarding the security concerns. Uh, I think the one in uh, the Red Hat guide is a little more comprehensive uh, because of all the flexibility that that's possible with OpenStack networking, uh, we we I don't think the upstream documentation is uh, is going to touch on on the specific steps and such to take uh, in in a cloud that you're building. Uh, but I would recommend lo looking at the Red Hat guide just for the literature, um, not recommending the use of Rel OSP or something. Fair enough. Yeah, and um, at the university, so we I'm we're at a university here, University of Victoria. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, we have access, full access to Red Hat's documentation as well as part of our licensing there. So that's nice. Oh yeah, great. Cool. And um, yeah, there's nothing, nothing secret there. It's just, a, but it get, you get out of uh, Manila proper into deployment concerns um, in this, you know, so, and, and they're important concerns, but. Okay, thank you, Mike. Gautam, I'll, I'll shut up now and yeah. let you talk again. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, so did anyone else here uh, have a concern that they want to bring up? So we can we can drive this via questions, um, and we we have some for you, but uh, in if if you have some, we'll prioritize those and talk about those because they're always more interesting. You know, one thing maybe to check also, Gotham, is um, how how many of the people present have actually already deployed Manila mm -hmm. and how many are considering deploying Manila and they're here because they want to, to learn about that possibility. Um, yeah. So um, but I, I, is everyone here familiar with Manila? Have you all deployed Manila? Can we do some sort of a uh, roll call of anybody here that is looking to explore it like Mike is? And, and if you would talk to us about your use cases, that would be one uh, something interesting to us.
everybody else is still sleeping like me. <laughs> well, I, I, I know that uh, I'm going to be a little bit rude here, but I know that Maurice Escher is awake. Uh, I will see if he's paying attention at the moment, but if he is, um, he has a fairly large deployment of Manila and might have some operational concerns in the following list and could help us prioritize them from his point of view. Can help us get the ball rolling here. Karthika, are you here by any chance and able to share? He can get back at me later for calling on him. <laughs> he may be uh, dealing with a large scale issue <laughs> at the same time. It's not nice to laugh. Anyway, he works at SAP and they have a large scale Manila uh, deployment, uh, several of them in fact, and um, he has driven a number of the uh, uh, performance and scale issues that we've worked on over the, over the years. I guess maybe that's a question too, is, is scalability. So we don't have at the, when we launch ours, we'll probably be launching with less than 10 clients running on it. Um, but this could easily scale out to as many clients as they would, as would like to have access. We're not restricting it. Is there, are there any gotchas as we, as we go forward to watch out for like how many users should be using the service? Is there uh, bandwidth or throughput concerns, that kind of thing? So, um, well, I mean, what this is, is, um, I mean, since Manila is not uh, exp uh, not operating in the data path, uh, you're, you're just interacting with Manila to do the provisioning and the management of your shared file systems, but not yeah, really uh, putting it in the data path, the service plane itself. Uh, so that, that's, that eliminates the, uh, the, 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 the question of, you know, how many clients can be connected. Uh, it is something that Manila cannot control. Uh, and, and it is, uh, it's, it, it falls back into the, into the, um, into the storage system itself or the storage solution. Um, so it technically you're, you're uh, I mean, it's as, as much scale as your, for example, in your case, this F cluster can offer. Okay. Yeah. The, um, on the scaling side on the control plane is where Manila's involved. Um, and that's actually where uh, Maurice, for instance, whose name I see up there at the moment, um, has had some interaction with Manila itself. Um, Maurice, are you there by any chance? I see your He's, name up. He can't unmute, apparently. I am, I am now. Is it working now? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, you, and yeah. thank you so much for <laughs> uh, volunteer you to talk. Yeah, we have uh, we have a pretty big Manila installation. I would say at SAP we are offering an OpenStack cloud internally for our developers. And yeah, the uh, special thing is maybe we are using uh, NetApp appliances as backends, and we have a lot of customers that want to use the uh, SIFS protocol. So I see myself supporting that a lot. And that's also something I, uh, where I put a, um, a line in the etherpad. What I see myself doing a lot is um, looking up errors in the, in the logs because uh, my customers can't find them themselves. So even if it's, some simple issue, some some typo in the in the DNS IP of the security service for SIFs, or yeah, the password is wrong. Or, or I always have to look it up in the in the logs. So that's that's the thing I I I do a lot, and I will hope that this could get better somehow. I so actually, Maurice, that, go ahead, Gotham. No, that that makes sense, uh, and I think. 
Uh, so uh, I don't know how many of you were at the user messages forum session earlier uh, yesterday, and uh, this was this was for Cinder, uh, the block storage service, and the uh, the concerns were very similar that there there was this um, uh, you know user messages feature that would that can allow users to take corrective action where, uh, you, you know, uh, they, and they don't need to talk to a cloud deployer or an administrator, but uh, Manila suffers from exactly the same problem as uh, Cinder does. Uh, we introduced user messages, uh, I mean, I guess about four or five releases ago, and users are familiar with it, but we have not covered all the possible recoverable cases. And the one that you, that you just mentioned seems like a bug to me. Uh, so if if they if they have a typo in their security service, this is something that the the shared driver would be able to detect, uh, and is would be able to report back to uh, the Manila API. And so if a, if a user is watching their messages, uh, and 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 takes a look at what why, why something happened, they they can actually go ahead delete that security service and 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 uh, create a new one. Yeah, that would really help to get this uh, a better to, to a state of a better self service. Yeah. So they don't have to open the support tickets and wait uh, quite right. a long time for, to fix an, an easy error. Yeah. Yep, that makes sense. I don't see uh, my friends from NetApp on this call. So I will uh, I'll, I will remind them and we can we can probably open a bug and, and fix this specific case. Uh, but this sort of thing is is actually uh, something that we we we'd, we'd really like folks to uh, start using and and reporting bugs on. You can extend the user messages uh, extensively, and you can even we we, we even have the ability to backport it to the releases that you are using. Uh, we've made uh, changes to user messages and added them uh, all the way back to queens and such because we know a lot of folks uh, are still running OpenStack queens. Yeah, so all the infrastructure is there. We just need to get the coverage. So opening bugs when you see them uh, will be really helpful. Um, and fixing them should not be that hard. So we ought to be able to make pretty good progress. And if you know what the message should say, <laughs> either put it in the bug or submit a fix yourself. But you don't have to pick, uh, propose a fix in order to file the bug. Yeah, it would just help to, to bubble, bubble up the, the NetApp error. Yeah, but especially if you have operational experience and you know um, what would be the most helpful thing to present to users. Um, yeah, not everything makes, yes, makes sense for them. Yeah. <laughs> right. oh, yeah. um, now, yeah, maybe, the, maybe, maybe a bit more. Uh, context for for others um, that are trying that as well. So we are running Manila uh, on Docker containers and Kubernetes, and that's working pretty well. So apart from the Manila share service, everything else is scalable. So you can run multiple containers of, of it. So works ah. good for us. Yeah, so that apart was an interesting remark that you just made. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on, on that? Yeah, the share service is not high available because it, uh, yeah, it, it, it controls one backend and all uh, communication to that and yeah, we, you can't have you can't have two um, share services running that that would then pick up the same messages. Yeah. So um, so the share service is not safe to run active active today. Um, is I guess the way I would phrase it. So uh, yeah. for example, when we deploy uh, our customers deploy, it is highly available, but in an single instance active standby way because we use pacemaker core sync to control it um, 
uh, you, on the other hand, are are more advanced and are using <laughs> running running it as a Docker um, um, in a Docker container, um, and you're saying that because it's not active active, you cannot scale the deployment um, under Kubernetes the way you can with, for instance, the Manila API service or the Manila scheduler service, which can run active active. Yeah, exactly. So important to us is the startup time of the share service and that's, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and especially, um, um, you know, one, one um, um, the head of the storage SIG at, uh, in um, Kubernetes uh, phrases it by saying Kubernetes is not an HA service. It guarantees eventual consistency and eventual recovery, but not quick failover, um, you know. So um, getting an active active service would enable you to keep a service up while Kubernetes uh, uh, controllers or whatever discover that, uh, you know, your scale number is not right and start up another service, another instance of the service. So you would like uh, active active service and have us prioritize that work. So I, I can speak to it a little bit more. Uh, so the active active service uh, has been on the back of our uh, ba backlog for a while now. And the at the very initial stage, um, I mean, this was possible to be deployed active active even today, you could, except we've not tested it. And that's why we don't claim support for it. Uh, so when you have two services that, um, that are uh, running active active uh, the way you configure them is to make them look and feel exactly alike uh, so rabbitmq when it when it when it, when it's communicating to these active active services knows to pick one of them uh, fairly uh, and and you you don't get into the aspect of the same message or the same action being repeated by two different services um, but the, the problem becomes when there are uh, these repeated polling uh, actions that are happening, uh, as well as when, uh, you know, what happens when some, somebody goes down uh, in the middle of an operation. Uh, so if, 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 if this is a long running operation, let's say you're, you're performing some share replication um, and, you're, you're, uh, and there is a thread in the share manager service that's waiting on the, on the back end to report back um, and and in the middle, uh, you know, something gets uh, broken, and and the service has to die. Um, so we we have a we, we have a problem determining whether that that sort of an action can be rescheduled uh, safely to another shared manager service that's managing the same backend. Um, and the, the, this also extends into another set of problems where there are storage so storage solutions that may not be prepared for two management threads uh, that, that are probably talking uh, you know, at the same time. And so they may have made some uh, assumptions about concurrency when it comes down to the storage system. Like for example, um, let's say you're, you're trying to add, um, you're trying to create snapshots uh, and there is some coordination in Manila to prevent you from you know, like overwhelming a storage system. But at the same time, you might have uh, instances where you know you might snapshot two different parts of your file system, uh, that is two different uh, distinct shares, at the exact same second uh, uh, in time. And oh, the last time we discussed this with this uh, with the uh, driver authors, that was a concern for some of the storage systems. Um, so they would have to step in and uh, and have to have some sort of process locking added to their uh, shared drivers specifically and test it against their uh, storage system specifically when we uh, by deploying it in active active and running through some tests and such. Uh, so that is why we weren't be, we were, we haven't been able to make these broad claims of uh, can we support active active and such because of these deficiencies. Uh, and we are certainly looking for help in this regard uh, because it's it's been the, it's been on the backlog but not bubbled up to the top of the priority stack uh, because there are, there have been other user requests that have more uh, you know 
weight on them. But like you said, I mean, the scalability of the service is something that's a very desir desirable thing. Uh, and we have, we did address the startup concerns uh, a couple of releases ago, I think, um, where we, 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 I mean, initially we used to reconcile all of the service, all of the service resources when some, when the share manager service goes down and comes back up, but now we don't. Uh, we ask the share drivers to take control of that. And if the share drivers detect something is wrong uh, or something has changed in, let's say their configuration or something in the backend storage, the share drivers will, uh, uh, you know, uh, push for an update. And this does not happen at startup. The, the, this, the, this happens maybe uh, in a deferred fashion as uh, after the service has started up. So existing resources are getting reconciled while new requests are being honored. That way, your uh, you know uh, your cloud is still operational, uh, and and nothing is happening um, due to the availability aspect. So I I'm very interested to talk more about this at the PTG uh, uh, that's there next week, and and we've at some point I think a couple of cycles ago made uh, a list of small items that need to be covered uh, to work, to continue to work on this path. Uh, and we made some progress, but it's not, we have not, we're not there yet. So if, if you are interested in helping, working with that, working on that, um, please let us know and, and come to the, for, uh, the, the, the project tech gathering and we can definitely go over it and discuss uh, specific issues, challenges, testing, and other, uh, other aspects. Yeah, sounds good. Huh? Thanks for these insights. Huh? Thanks, Morris. I will be there next week, yeah. Awesome. I, I did want to uh, talk about that in the, uh, in the uh, I mean, uh, talk about availability a little bit more uh, with serviceability aspect. So uh, like Morris is doing, you can run any number of copies of the Manila API, the Manila scheduler, and but, uh, but not um, the Manila share service um, because of all of these concerns. And but but when the when the service stack stack breaks down because of some reason, uh, things are lost. And we uh, we we're, we're, we're this is a concern that um, for example, I think Leron's on this call. Uh, he's tested uh, Manila ex, uh, extensively with uh, the, the, the REL OSP uh, cloud. And uh, he's seen a lot of concerns where, uh, you know, he intentionally causes a failover, um, but then the resources are stuck in some state uh, at, the, at the time when the service went down. And when the service comes back up, that particular resource is still, uh, you know, unfinished. Uh, or it's not getting rescheduled or anything of that sort. So if you have concerns like this, we'd like to know. I think Leron opened a, a few bugs. Thanks, uh, Leron. And I don't have links handy, but I think he was observing um, access rules specifically, not being applied when, when, when uh, the service is being restarted. Any any of you have seen any other any other concerns such as these that we need to take a look at? And this recoverability is not just when the service stack goes down because of some issue. I mean, these issues can be network issues. You know, the Docker container just died. Uh, uh, sort of things yeah, or the node that was running the Manila share service just went kaput, but they, they, they could, it could also be uh, when you're going through an upgrade uh, and there are operations in the, on, on the fly because we want to make, um, for example, upgrades as smooth as possible and you don't really need, uh, uh, you know, uh, any amount of downtime uh, uh, when you're performing an upgrade. Um, especially if we are handling things properly, that would be the concern. But we are at the same time not saying like if you have a 
massively distributed cloud where you're uh, running multiple services, uh, we do not recommend a rolling upgrade, not with Manala at least. Uh, we do expect that the database uh, connections are off, uh, that all the services are not writing actively to the database so that we can perform a database upgrade and then you can fire up the services back up again. Um, and that, that would, uh, that's the current upgrade concern. But as with um, most OpenStack services, there is nothing uh, that is, that's going to affect existing resources that are controlled by Manala uh, when you're going through an upgrade. If clients are connected to their shares or they're, they're uh, you know, write, actively writing or reading data, that they should not be dis, uh, disrupted at all when you're going through the service upgrade. Um, because all we're doing is probably toggling metadata to take advantage of the uh, of the newer um, uh, you, you know features that have come in in this new release. So Gotham, we're out of time, and I noticed that someone else just took over as host, and we oh, have yeah. to clear the room. Uh, but um, um, the Etherpad is still open, and uh, Gotham and I will put our email addresses in there as well as IRC. So please join us. Uh, this conversation can continue um, on the, on the Etherpad. Great. Yes, on the Etherpad as well as uh, please uh, please do join us at the uh, PTG uh, next week, and I, I'll, I'll send I'll put up links on the Etherpad for that as well, so we can continue this uh, this sort of questions questions in. Thank you to both of you. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Absolutely. everybody. Thanks for joining. Thank you.